thank all of you for your different stories that have definitely some culminating themes. Um, I did want to go ahead and uh, give the audience an opportunity to ask questions to any of the individuals up here. Again, we um, wanted to have them share their stories to share, you know, what it's like to, to be them and live in their skin, how they both experience adversity as well as um, triumph, as well as allies, as well as people who supported them and helping them get to where they are. So, does anyone have any questions? Joe, what is the difference between mentorship and sponsorship? The question was, what is the difference between mentorship and sponsorship? Great question. Um, so I, I learned this pretty recently, and it's been something that has been uh, extremely powerful and rewarding for me. Sponsorship means that you have more investment in the outcome of the person that you're working with and supporting. It means that you're actively going out to expose your network put yourself at risk, and put yourself out there to ensure that the person that you're working with is successful. A mentor is, you know, I, I think all of us here have mentors. We give them advice sporadically, once a month. It's almost haphazard, but it, it doesn't really result in anything too meaningful. Sponsorship is you're actually going out of your way and showing this person that you're investing in their, in their future. And there's such a, Maybe for some people a subtle nuance there, but it could mean the world of difference to someone who is looking to uh, come up in the world. So now you can I add something? So um, the, the, the thing about sponsorship that is really important, for, particularly for this group today, is that we tend to sponsor others like us. And if we stick with that formula, then a lot of people that are not in power, the majority of people in power are the, people in, the majority of people in this room. So unless you are, and then you perceive that there is risk involved, generally there's a perception that if you sponsor a woman or a person of color, it's risky. So my challenge to you today is take a look at the talent and go beyond your, your, your comfort zone. It's not that it's risky, it's your comfort zone. It's own, your own biases. We're not riskier. You just don't know us, how great we are. <laughs> right on, Noni. <laughs> I would also add mentorship is, also a power structure in, in a way in that that person is teaching, right? They're in, you're there to learn something from a mentor. Uh, sponsors often act without being even in a um, higher level. Um, I've had, I'm learning to just tell people, hey, I, I kind of know everything I need to know. I just need you to use your privilege and power to open a door for me or to introduce me. Any other questions? Uh, thank you all for sharing your stories um, in the spirit of vulnerability. I think this is a really touching way to start the day. Um, and in that light, uh, I'm a psychologist, and a lot of what I have gathered is that our families are very, very important, certainly as children and as we even grow into adults, in shaping our worldview. I'm a woman of color, and I can say that from my own perspective, that's been the case. Can you talk a little bit about today, and what um, is the reaction of your parents or other close relatives on your journey and the fact that you're here talking about this so openly and vulnerably? Yeah, so I'll start with this one. So my family, it's interesting, my father just said to me the other day, I was talking to him and he said, I'm just gonna sit down and because I can't keep up with you in terms of where you're going, but I know you're gonna do something really special. And I remember, you know, at a very young age, I realized I was different, right? And I was different um, really because of the color of my skin. Not just the color, but the darkness of my skin. I used to remember thinking that I was literally the blackest person on earth. And I'm not kidding, I really thought I was the color of this jacket. Um, and my family used to call me chocolate. And I kept thinking, why do they call only me chocolate, right? Um, and, but but what, that, what that did for me was it helped me to understand, one, that I was different, but that I was extremely special to every single person in my family as well. They loved me unconditionally without a shadow of a doubt. 
And so now, when they see pictures of me on Facebook or you know things that where I've done speaking engagements, they are probably more proud of me than I am of myself. So I think family plays a huge role in what has shaped me to be the person I am today, both in terms of confidence, um, know-how, and appreciation for others. And so for me, family has played a really big role. Well, Karen, I want you to know that in El Salvador, I was always teased for being the darkest girl in school. So, <laughs> so um, I would say I, I come from a, a very distinguished mother. My mother was the first woman doctor in El Salvador. My father was a famous uh, public health doctor. So I came from people that had overachieved, broken every ceiling, done everything, traveled, had the most exposure. So. I actually was a bit of a the sloucher in the family. <laughs> the, uh, no, because you had such a high benchmark. I had a wonderful role model. But my, my parents always, I guess my, my, my story is that my parents always expected me to do well. And I guess I lived up to say I did very well. So it was almost like, yeah, of course she's going to do well. So. Sorry about that. Just going back to the question, what role does family play in, in the outcomes? It's a tough question. I, I wish we had more time to really dive into that one because I came from a lot of instability. My parents were divorced. My dad was on his third marriage, uh, heroin, alcohol, everything, you name it, in my family. Um, went to an all deaf school, but there was this sense of expectation. Um, my father was, the was um, he dropped out of middle school. My mom was a high school graduate, waitress. Um, but there was this, there's always this expectation that I was going to do something more. And I think expectations really played into it because it laid the groundwork, a fertile field, if you will, for me to, to thrive and grow uh, and to try and aspire to something greater. Um, and when I was in the classroom as a high school math teacher, uh, if anybody here is from Richmond, I used to teach at Richmond High School, expectations were embedded into everything we do. Um, so expectations for employees, for family members, really says a lot about what you think of them and what you think they can achieve. Um, so that was really important for me. So I would say that, you know, I had an opportunity to go up to Washington DC where my family lives now. And I asked my, one of my cousins, I said, you know, you, you're one of the very few people that watches my stuff and, and follows me. What do you think? And he said, I'm glad that you're telling your story because it's important. And it gives me inspiration to live my life. Um, because there, there's a lot of pressures, especially if you're a Middle Eastern female. Um, you're told at a very young age that, okay, well, marriage is the path that you choose. I mean, I certainly was told that. And so when I speak publicly about things like this and I tell women and girls that they have an opportunity to choose, um, to hear that from her, and it, it's, it's interesting because my daughter had um, an opportunity to, to do a, um, at the time she was applying for colleges and she was doing an interview and she was, she was asked this question, hey, you, you're thinking about applying and going to this all-female college, uh, you know, for some, it's tough, uh, how do you feel about it? And she was like, uh, oh, my mother's a feminist, I am one too, so uh, we're good. Um, so I think that's important. And, and I, I say this is important because in, in, the, in Farsi, the word for, for woman is zan, and the word for hit is bizan. And so it, men would say in the word hit, the word woman is included. I mean, you can imagine the, the horrors of what women in Afghanistan are facing today, in particular in domestic violence. And so you can see where that stems from. And to have, um, in my case, I was in college and I, it was the first time that I walked into this class and uh, this woman, it was called Psychology of Women. And there's, there's this woman and she's dressed like, does anybody remember the Powerpuff Girls cartoon? She was a Powerpuff girl. And I walked in and she was like, you know, feminism. And I, I was like, oh, the bra burning ladies. And it was such a, a revelation to have that word and to know that that's who I was and what I stood for. Um, I still don't burn bras, um, judging by how much Victoria's Secret costs. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but I, I, it, it's, 
it's speaking for, for women's equality and, and the work that needs to be done. Owning that word is important and to know that I empower the, the women in my, my fa immediate family is rewarding. Next. I, uh, thank you for sharing your stories. Uh, you know, it, it, it seems to be that uh, in listening to all of you that you all sit at the intersection of uh, passion, joy, and success. And, and I'm interested in knowing, uh, uh, I'm assuming at an early age you all figured out what your passion was. Uh, and uh, that has brought you the joy that you have and obviously the success. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you went about finding that passion in your life and, and, and what drove you to, to so relentlessly uh, chase after it? Sure. <laughs> um, so, so I actually didn't realize that I was passionate about diversity and inclusion until I had that interaction with Mike and realized that I had been treating someone um, in a way in which I had been really upset that I had been treated um, previously. And so when I realized and had that epiphany that um, not, not only did it hit me so deeply, I had something to share about it. And, and literally when I say it was at that moment that I, it completely changed my life, um, it was at that moment. And so from there, just knowing the pain that I had felt from you know, not being appreciated for who I was as a person simply because of my color or my gender, that was what kind of gave me that passion to be able to make sure that you know, as my girls started to grow up and be young adults, that they weren't going to be treated, treated in the same way and that they were going to have every opportunity to succeed regardless of what they look like. And I have beautiful girls who are very different color, you know, skin tone than I am and who are probably afforded some luxury because they are more light skin. But I didn't want them, I didn't want that to be what they thought in terms of the value of what they brought to the world. I wanted it to be about what they felt inside and where their value values were and so for them it's all for me it's all about how do I motivate them so that they can motivate others to make a, to really make a change in the world because even if I look back and how long I've been doing this work you know you know 10 or 15 years now the world around diversity and inclusion has really changed and so for me it's about making sure that every single person understands that they are diverse by the way, even straight white men are diverse. And until we become much more inclusive about how we talk about the, this subject, the more it's gonna be more of a segregated conversation. And we have to help, help everybody understand that everyone has a story. Um, and when you, your story, you haven't walked in my shoes, you can't walk in my shoes, I can't walk in anyone else's shoes, but we all have a story and we have all um, have stories that have impacted us in ways in which we can share and learn from other people. So for me, that's where the passion comes, comes from, is just realizing that this whole subject around diversity and inclusion and belonging um, can impact the world, not just our little circles, but the world to make this a better place. So that's where my passion comes from. I'll just add um, the, your question about passion. Everyone here has achieved some amount of success. And I think there's something intrinsically inside you all that pushes you, right, beyond the body you were born in or the ability or ability you don't have, et cetera. Um, there's a saying in most minority communities that you have to work twice as hard, right? Um, I just want us to be mindful as well of the other people who, when they come up against adversity, are just tired, right? It is hard to overcome adversity, and um, I, I personally am a fighter, and I, I like a challenge, but I get tired sometimes as well. But I think it's important to recognize that as well, is that you know every, everyone has a different amount of threshold of what they can take and what they can't take in the workplace, in the community, and where, however they live and breathe. And it's important to recognize that if we're opening doors and we have allies to really support those people in different ways, it creates more opportunity, right? For those who just, who, who don't have it. And I'd like any of you to share on that as well in terms of just even in your own families or people you've been able to mentor yourselves on, you know, that drive. 
So now I'd like to add to you what you're saying because I think it's very important. We tend to speak of privilege and non-privilege. We tend to speak like, and sometimes I feel that the conversation seems like to say that the Caucasian males, straight males have all the privilege and the rest of the people don't. And that's a horrible mistake. We all have privilege. Mm -hmm. We all, so the question is what do we do with that privilege when we have it, because it's situational. I might be walking outside and somebody doesn't speak Spanish, I do. I have a position of privilege. Will I help them? I, that's how I choose to use my privilege. It's not always that way. It's not, we're not always under privilege. And the, the empowerment comes when we realize that we, everyone has privilege. Now there's more people that have more privilege and they can use it more often. But it's not to say that we are sitting there waiting for someone to extend their privilege to us. We have a responsibility, we need to role model it, so I take ownership of what my share needs to be in this, in this challenge. I might be, have more privilege than a Caucasian male in situations and I need to extend it. It's my choice and it is my, it is my gift to be able to share my privilege. Yeah. Can, I, can I comment? Tobias, can I comment on, on this as well? Because I think Noni is, is touching on something that is super critical in the context of this conversation today and that is the two-way street. Right? I'm not looking for the straight white male to solve every problem that I have. And it's important, it is critical for me to open the door for people to be able to ask me questions. And it's important that I meet people halfway as opposed to thinking that, that, that somebody else is gonna do something for me. So you know, one, one of the things that, that we talk about a lot is really about the courage to, to ask the questions, right? The courage to step into that conversation, even if you don't know exactly how to ask the question. It's more important to step into it versus not say anything. And I think that that's where we um, have gone critically wrong in today's world because we're so afraid to say the wrong thing. And so it paraly we're paralyzed for saying the wrong thing. I don't wanna ask the question and you don't wanna ask the question. So really this is about how do we open the door on both sides so that I'm more receptive to listening to you, you're more receptive to listening to me. I can ask any question that's gonna help us build a stronger relationship and you can do the same as well. And so we've really gotta you know, kind of open up this, this world of communication and relationship so that we can all come together to do a lot better around this topic. Um, so going back to your question about passion, um, the thing that Mr. Hayes taught me and um, was this what he called dig a better ditch. And, and then and, and let me explain the story behind it. So he, he was drafted in the army during the Vietnam War and he really didn't want to be there. Um, and part of his job was that you know he had to dig these ditches which was used to like get rid of human feces. Um, and he hated it and he would sit there and he would just you know like grunt about it and complain. And every day he would go there, he realized that the day took longer and longer and longer. And so he finally realized, well, maybe there's a better way to do something. So he, he focused, because um, he realized that wasn't working for him. So he said, okay, well, let me just go back and, and focus on building, you know, digging a better ditch. And so that's what he did. And part of when I, when I was working with him was, you know, focus on building and, or digging a better ditch. And because that led to something else and then led to something else and it led to something else. And at the time when I was in his office, I was, I was pretty much ready to quit and I didn't, I didn't you know. And he was, he was making me focus on the grunt work and, and the importance of doing a good job with the grunt work because then that would enable you to go achieve your passions. Um, when I first met him, I didn't realize the importance of this lesson and just how critical that was until, you know, something led to something else to something else and pretty soon I, 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 was, I was not digging ditches anymore. I was doing something else. So. We've got one final question in the back. Hello, I've been holding the mic for 10 minutes. So thank you so much for the honor to ask this question. And more importantly, thank you all so much for, for sharing your stories with us. It's incredibly inspiring. I'd like to direct my question to Karen. Um, and it's really, I, I, I'd be so interested to know how in your role um, are you bringing really kind of the mind shift around um, those 
like microaggressions and the unconscious biases. And, and, and how, how is that going? Where are you finding you're having your greatest successes? And also, where are you running up against your largest barriers? And I'm gonna be, just chuck it in if it works. And I'd love to know as well it, it, um, whether ageism kind of feeds into that as well. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so let me answer it in a, in a couple of different ways. The first thing is, you know, we there, there's education around unconscious bias. And so I think the first thing is um, just bringing awareness, you know, awareness that we all have bias, I think is probably the, the first place to start. But you can't just start, you can't just stop with awareness. You have to actually figure out what do you do with this information and this power now that you recognize that you have bias. And in my case, it was, oh my God, I have this bias against the way that this person looks. Now what can I do to educate myself to turn that story around? And so there's a lot of education that we do um, ar at our company around, um, around just what is bias and then what do you actually do with it? How do you mitigate it? But there's also bias written in probably every process that we deal with within our corporations as well. So it's also not just always relying on people to remove the bias, but also helping us understand and going through your processes around, around how you um, look at bias as well. I think in, in reference to ageism, if you think about the generation that most of us are probably in, right? We're probably, you know, most of us are probably Gen X or baby boomers. We have this hang up around diversity and inclusion. We have this hang up around race. We have this hang up around gender. And this has played out in our lifetimes. And so I think um, ageism or the generations that we are currently in certainly play a role. I think as we think about the next couple of generations, Gen X and Gen Z, or, or Gen Y and Gen Z that are um, gonna overtake us in the workplace in the next five to 10 years, they're gonna start to change this conversation around diversity. The way that we think about it today, I think is gonna be extremely different, right? We talk about it in the context of black and white and, and Latin X and gender, but if you think about it, think about all the stories that we're hearing about today where this story is now going to be changed. It's not going to be that I'm going to check one box around who I am anymore. We're much more of blended intersectionality humans in terms of where we want to see ourselves in the world go. And I think these upcoming generations are really going to cause us pause to think about this subject very differently. The last thing I'll say is uh, just in reference to intersectionality is um, the fact that a lot of the issues and problems that we're seeing are no longer a, a single affinity issue anymore, right? Women's issues are not just women issues. Our travel ban is, are, is not just about people who can't travel into our country. It's about how do we access talent? How do we access innovation? So these are issues that we're gonna have to start to address together as opposed to divisively. So, you know, for me, I think I think not just age, ageism, but a lot of these other things are gonna change the way that we look at this space around diversity and inclusion. Thank you. Well, that is it for today's panel, but thank you all for joining us. It's been a true pleasure having you all up here, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you.